Congressman Fatah is a Philadelphian himself and has lived in this city his entire life. He attended University of Pennsylvania's Fell School of Government where he received his MGA. Before his election to the U.S. Congress in 1994, Congressman Fatah served six years as a representative in the Pennsylvania State House, followed by six years as a state senator. Congressman Fatah has represented 2nd District of Pennsylvania in the U.S. House of Representatives and currently is serving his 10th term. Congressman Fatah is focused on many legislative priorities, including manufacturing innovation, youth mentoring programs, and GEAR UP, which stands for Gaining Early Awareness and Readiness for Undergraduate Students. Specifically for this audience, though, he's known for his promotion of neuroscience research through the Fatah Neuroscience Initiative, which is an innovative policy initiative that aims to coordinate federal research across agencies and draw upon public-private partnerships in the world of academia. The initiative promotes research and discovery across brain cognition, development, disease, and injury. As such, it is my honor to call onto stage Congressman Chaka Fatah. Thank you. Now, they, they give me a microphone, so can everyone hear me? Yeah. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, and it's always great for me to be back on Penn's campus because uh, I have some of my fondest memories uh, from my time here at the Fell School of Government. Uh, and also, my wife went to law school at the law school here, and uh, my uh, eldest uh, daughter is a graduate of, uh, of Penn. So we are, um, we are a Penn family. And it's glad to be able to come and spend a few uh, minutes with you today. I know you've been through uh, a period, and there's, the thing that's separating you from the picnic is my talk. <laughs> uh, uh, but I was asked to give a, an hour-long discussion about neuroscience. Uh, I'm going to cut you a break. I'm going to go only 51 minutes. <laughs> um, but I do want to uh, say... Uh, that uh, I am very thankful that each and every one of you have decided, uh, as part of your academic pursuits, uh, to focus in on what I think is the most important area for scientific uh, discovery and investigation, and that is the human brain. And the fact that I think it is one thing, but the, the fact that I'm now in my 10th term the leading appropriator for the Democrats in the Congress on all of our science investigation makes it much more important that I think that neuroscience is a superior among equals because we now have elevated neuroscience to the literally the number one focus of the work of the federal government in terms of increasing our investment in science. Uh, I passed uh, two years ago language in an appropriations bill uh, that created the first ever high priority government-wide research project uh, focused on neuroscience. It's brought together all of our federal agencies uh, and the interagency working group on neuroscience uh, was charged with developing a number of non-incremental policy initiatives that, so that we could make disruptive progress in this area. Uh, and it brought together NIH and the National Science Foundation and a dozen other federal agencies, the Food and Drug Administration, and I could go on and on. But the point is, is everyone in the same room agreeing to play well together, uh, to uh, join hands, uh, and uh, to focus on an area that could make a real difference uh, for our country and our world. And so we passed that into law, and uh, I've just now uh, passed uh, the kind of second phase of this, which is an effort to bring the pharmaceutical community together uh, and a coordinated effort. Uh, and so we've had some major achievements, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but I do want to recognize uh, um, Dr. Jensen, who, who's come in. We've met, uh, I've been doing over the last couple of years, a nationwide uh, tour uh, meeting with uh, the leading experts uh, in neuroscience. And I happened uh, one day upon uh, uh, a visit in a small little town no one's ever heard of, Boston, um, 
you know, they got a few colleges there. Anyway, I was there, and I, I was at, um, is it uh, the Children's Hospital? Um, and I got a chance, it was the, I had spent much of the morning at a Pfizer facility with 150 neuroscientists. And then I went over to Harvard uh, to visit a lab on early childhood learning and pediatric brain development. But then I got a chance to meet uh, Dr. Jensen, and she kind of crystallized for me as a policymaker what the, how to kind of put all of this in some perspective. Now, she's the, uh, singularly the nation's, the nation's uh, leader on epilepsy and uh, a lot of other work. But she said to me, look, it's really simple. If you're trying to understand this, the human brain has got two kind of things going on all at once. You know, you got, you got inhibitors and you got exciters. And, you know, if they get out of balance in your brain, you got a problem and you got a challenge. And, but if they're imbalanced, then it all kind of works out. And so anyway, lo and behold, within minutes of meeting her, she had agreed to come to Penn. And uh, to, <laughs> it was probably within days. That, so now, I don't even have to go to Boston to confer. I'm right here in my own neighborhood. Uh, so uh, welcome to University of Penn. And thank you for coming. And, uh, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, but let me get to the heart of this. So I, I, let me get 30,000 feet up in the air. So in terms of space exploration and the $17 billion or so we're going to invest at NASA or the uh, $7 billion, uh, hopefully we're going to invest in the National Science Foundation and all of our work at NIST, uh, our work at our national laboratories. I have the, the, the principal responsibility to decide at least for my team in the Congress, how much of the tax money that you and your parents pay are we going to invest and what we're going to spend it on. So we're going to spend $8 billion to launch, to build and launch the James Webb Telescope. Uh, and we're going to launch this in 2018. But to put it in perspective, I've visited operating rooms uh, where uh, neurosurgeons are doing uh, uh, work uh, trying to save the lives of people, and they tell me they need better imaging tools. And so what I've tried to do is to reconcile these things, to say that what we need to do is make sure, even as we spend uh, uh, lots of money on very important work, and I'm a supporter of the James Webb Telescope, but that we don't miss the point that for uh, American families, making sure that there are imaging tools and diagnostic tools available for the well over 500 diseases and disorders of the brain, um, that we prioritize that. So this, this high priority research effort, the working group, its report, which will be formally out in about 60 days, will lay out some very important investments that our country is going to make in this area. The leading edge of the spear is the brain mapping initiative. So when the president walked into the East Room uh, and announced this, uh, there was the president, there were about 500 of uh, uh, the, 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 the foundation leaders and neuroscientists and um, college presidents, Amy Gutman was, uh, was there, and, um, and there was one member of Congress, and that was me, uh, because we have pushed this envelope, and we now have concurrence uh, from the administration and from a bipartisan group of leaders in the Congress, which as you know is an amazing accomplishment, <laughs> that we actually are going to prioritize neuroscience. Um, and this is, uh, this, is, this is critical. We have well over five million families who are dealing with uh, a family member with Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. We have this year, like last year, maybe even like the year coming up, something close to two million young, mainly young people, but not always young people, who are gonna have some form of traumatic brain injury. Uh, so we have 40% uh, of our injured uh, soldiers, uh, veterans who are returning home, uh, have uh, post-traumatic stress or uh, some other form of, uh, of, uh, of, of brain uh, uh, injury. 
next weekend I'll be in California with uh, uh, Garen uh, Staglin and, and his, his wife. Where they've raised uh, well over half a billion dollars to invest in mental health uh, research. Uh, so this issue of schizophrenia, which you were talking about when I came in, and um, the other challenges that are relative to the, cha the, the issues related to mental health, um, you know, from depression to um, all the way to the other end of uh, uh, the, the spectrums uh, that are um, relevant there. We have a lot of issues that we can, I think, better attack. One of the first things we need is we need able scientists. We need people like you who are going to commit themselves uh, to research in an area in which, as best as I can tell, I've talked to Nobel laureates um, like um, uh, Stanley Prusner, who's a, a Penn alum, and, uh, and, and many, many others. Uh, and, and I've been a lot of places. I've been to, you know, at the uh, Washington, uh, University of Washington, at St. Louis, and they've been, they've been at the very forefront, the uh, Connect Dome Project and a whole host of other activities, and uh, the UCLA, and I've been out to, um, uh, I've been far and wide throughout the country. As best as I can tell, um, when you talk to the people who are most knowledgeable, they'll tell you that we know about something close to 1% of what we need to know about how the human brain actually works. You know, with 100 billion neurons, with a trillion and a half uh, connections. We don't understand the basic wiring as well as we need to. We don't have a, a, a very good understanding of the chemical interactions uh, in the brain uh, and the brain's uh, direction and how it works uh, as it uh, directs other parts of uh, our bodies to, uh, uh, to act. So there's a lot that we um, can gain as a nation uh, from investing here. Now, we're spending $200 billion last year on Alzheimer's care. That is care for people with Alzheimer's. Something like 10% of people 65 and older. Now, if you talk about population 85 and older, about 40% with Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. In a country in which uh, the fastest growing demographic group is 90 to 100. That is to say that we are going to live longer. Degenerative brain diseases are a major challenge to families. They're also going to be a challenge to our fiscal health. When you read down into the boring details of the, uh, um, the credit downgrade letters for some of our European allies, You'll look at Moody's and some of these other downgrade letters. They have a list of the reasons why they downgraded their credit as nations. And one of them says, lack of effective treatment for degenerative brain diseases. Because in all of our developing countries, our developed countries, this is a challenge. It's going to, it is a challenge. And it's becoming, as people age, it is going to become more and more of a challenge to the financial circumstances of these nations, including our own. So it's great that we estimate that we're going to spend, for instance, at NIH this year, about $5.6 billion on neuroscience. But that pales in comparison to just the number we're spending on Alzheimer's care. And if you take the 500 plus diseases and disorders of the brain, um, you can almost use the same um, set of sentences and just take out the name of the disease or disorder. That is that we don't know exactly how it's caused. We don't have effective treatments. And we know in clinical trials there's a dearth of translational uh, um, uh, uh, viability for uh, even when, and you had some discussion about rodents earlier, and I, I notice the more I hang around neuroscientists, the more people talk about rodents. <laughs> um, but it's the translational side of uh, the success uh, from rodent to humans uh, is in the neuroscience space, there is almost uh, non-existent as compared to other uh, uh, efforts uh, in terms of medical innovation and pharmaceutical 
uh, um, uh, solutions to challenges. So it is a major problem. That's part of the reason why we've had such a retreat from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, because they have on one hand a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. And so if you got 800, you know, uh, 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 cancer uh, treatments on the oncology side that, um, and you got, you've invested billions on neuroscience and you're not come up with anything that uh, you can, you, that you can uh, reward uh, your shareholders with uh, some return on making the decision in the boardroom about where you're going to invest the research has put neuroscience at a slightly, well not just a slightly, but at a disadvantage. Um, so part of the, so the first thing I've done is I've created this intergovernmental working group at the federal level among the, the, uh, the federal government entities, which is now getting ready to issue its, its report and the president has preempted at least one item, uh, which is the, uh, is the brain mapping effort. But this latest success of mine, which is, and we're gonna do a formal rollout uh, from the White House within the next 30 days or so. Um, we have some other interventions, you know, we've got Syria, we've got a few other things going on at the meantime, but is this, this language that was embodied in the last appropriations bill, uh, which will now bring the entire pharmaceutical industry together around how it is that we can set a path forward, which could include investments uh, that the pharmaceutical industry would receive that would not be um, tied to or intertwined with their fiduciary responsibilities uh, so that they could do research. Because the one, the one thing about the pharmaceutical community is that they, they're not really focused on you know, rodents. They really are focused on humans and there's a, um, there's a, a, a difference uh, in their approaches uh, because they're on the kind of for-profit side and they, they just are, uh, but I think we need them in this battle. So I'm interested in diseases and disorders. That's not my only interest. And as you see by the language of the, um, of the initiative that I'm leading, I'm also interested on the workings of the healthy brain uh, and how it functions and what it can, what we can learn from the brain, uh, from studying the brain in terms of uh, teaching and learning uh, I am uh, someone who spent a lot of time focused on higher education policy, but from what I have gathered from some of the very best experts is that the greatest opportunity for our young people to learn is at the earliest parts of their life. And so we need to be thinking more about how uh, we structure our educational processes going forward and how it can be informed in terms of what we learn about pediatric brain development and the learning capabilities of young people uh, because it will enhance us as we go forward. Um, so that's where, that's, uh, that's what I am um, focused on every single day. I was in Ireland. Uh, the EU had a major conference called uh, Healthy Europe, A Healthy Brain is a Healthy Europe. And I was just there in Dublin. Uh, it, was, uh, it was great to see the 27 uh, nations of the European Union come together and they've decided that even though they're cutting almost everything else, that they're actually going to increase their investment in neuroscience. Uh, and in fact, there's an announcement being made by my office um, within the next uh, 24 hours or so that right here in uh, University City, I'm bringing the head of the uh, European uh, Union's uh, uh, science effort to uh, announce that the 80 billion euros that they are putting aside for this uh, research, that they want to do that in conjunction with uh, researchers uh, right here in the greater Philadelphia area. And we're going to have a big announcement. And they're only going to fund projects in which there are joint uh, uh, initiatives. And I want to say something about this notion of collaboration uh, as, we, as, as, uh, as we go forward. Next month, I'm going to be keynoting a conference uh, uh, in Israel. It's the Israel uh, uh, International Brain Tech Conference. And um, the president of Israel invited me to come to kick off this conference. Uh, and it's around um, the interface between technology and the challenges of the brain uh, and where we can make real um, 
real progress in this regard. And there's so much uh, exciting news in that, in, that, in that space that it is um, of note that we already have a number of collaborations between Israeli scientists and, um, and scientists from the United States, but most importantly from, at least in this respect to this conversation, in the greater Philadelphia area. I mean, they're literally, the rewalk system, which is to help uh, people who are paralyzed, uh, uh, was developed in Israel. The clinical trials are taking place here at Einstein. Uh, and now has been rolled out to uh, six of our uh, veterans hospitals around the country. Uh, and it's a remarkable system. Obviously, um, you, when you are uh, in a situation, I saw a, a, a a soldier who had been uh, paralyzed uh, and had been in a wheelchair for uh, well over 15 years, uh, up and walking uh, with this system. Uh, it was amazing right here at, uh, at, uh, in, at Albert Einstein. So this point about collaboration, I guess, is the main point of my work. And um, you know, there's a biblical refrain about Nehemiah when he's trying to rebuild the walls. Uh, and he says, you know, we can rebuild the walls if we have a mind, we can repair the walls if we have a mind to work. But beyond that often repeated phrase, at least by me, uh, is that it really, he says, you've got to get people from all the different families, all the different ethnic groups. Everybody's got to work together. And that's my theory about neuroscience, that we've got to get people from all of the disciplines and all of the particular focuses because uh, someone looking for um, a cure or a treatment for Alzheimer's might find something in the work that's being done looking at some other disorder or disease that could be a trigger for their ultimate success. That the idea that focusing just in kind of narrow pathways, uh, I don't believe are going to lead to the successes that we want to make. And so, by bringing all the federal agencies together and hopefully by bringing the pharmaceutical industry together, I think we actually can make uh, some major progress. And that's the uh, theory I'm operating off of. I'm looking for, uh, on the pharmaceutical side, on the research side, uh, I'm looking for where we can create open source uh, collaboration if possible, or at least uh, in periods of um, the uh, initial uh, research where that might be useful. Uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity where we can have at least, when we put all of the federal agencies together, there were uh, professional staffers who were saying, oh, there are going to be all these turf battles between NIH and the National Science Foundation and this group and that group. When they got together, it was the most exciting group of neuroscience people you've ever seen. I walked into the, Acad the National Academy of Science uh, and uh, gave a talk maybe a year and a half ago. And it was just an amazing thing to see the level of excitement that the federal government was uh, going to put neuroscience at the very top of the leaderboard uh, and that we were actually going to uh, create a process in which, as appropriate, we were prepared to fund. We are prepared to make the funding commitments, but we want an agreement about where we need to make these investments uh, that will uh, really make an impact. Uh, and we don't mind failing, but we do want to have a consensus about what direction we ought to go in and where we need to make the investments, particularly in terms of diagnostic tools, imaging tools. Um, there's some debate about whether we should map the brain or not map the brain. You know, uh, I'm all for mapping the brain. It's, uh, it's obviously something that I've had uh, something to do with in terms of moving this policy initiative forward. The EU's got a different proposal. Their proposal, you know, is about a billion and a half dollars. They want to do a computational modeling of the brain. I don't see these things as distinct and different. Uh, I, in fact, see that they can work uh, together for a, a, um, uh, for a common good. Uh, so there are a number of different ways to go at this, uh, but I think that if we can get people working together, and, and, and you know, sometimes uh, our desire uh, for individualized success takes us but only so far, and that through working together we can create uh, an even greater uh, success. And that's what I think, and I think at each level, I think the United States working together with the EU, uh, as will be the announcement that we'll make here around uh, September 20th, uh, are the federal agencies working together so that they're 
there's a cross fertilization. So for instance, you know, DARPA, somebody says, well, why do you have a defense uh, uh, um, you know, agency like DARPA in the deal? Well, I said, well, first of all, as an appropriator, there's a whole lot of money over in DARPA, <laughs> right? I mean, when we, we were, there was an issue once where they, you know, we're trying to get more money for, for breast cancer research. And anyway, we ended up sticking it in the Department of Defense budget, right? They said, well, why would you put, you know, tens of millions of dollars over there? And they said, well, because once a defense bill goes on the floor, we know it's going to pass. There's, you know, I mean, nobody, the members don't want to be accused of being weak on defense. And, you know, there are a whole bunch of different reasons why it passes, but it passes by overwhelming margin, right? So DARPA, which is the, a premier in, uh, in, uh, organization in terms of innovation, uh, is a great place to uh, have seeded the investment on brain mapping. Um, and what people don't know is when they talk about, in this context, especially when we talk about mapping the brain, they talk about the Human Genome Project, that this being similar to that effort, right? Well, the Human Genome Project was not financed through NIH. It, the initial money was financed, believe it or not, through the Department of Energy. Uh, so, but when the, and you'll find this out as you get your research grants, you really don't really care which agency. <laughs> right? I mean, if someone says that what, on, on basis of merit, that you have an idea that's worthy of investigation, and that you're going to be the PI, and they're going to fund you for five years so that you can get to the see whether or not what you uh, believe is true, right? And that the science bears out, do you really care whether it comes from the Department of Energy or DARPA or NIH or National Science Foundation? It, you know, so at the end of the day, my belief as an appropriate, I just got on the um, uh, Veterans Affairs Appropriations Committee, right? And uh, I already have enough work to do. Uh, but I got on this committee because in the VA, their focus on neuroscience is ramping up. Well, why is it ramping up? It's ramping up in part because veterans, TPI injuries. It's also ramping up as our million plus veterans are aging. They're interested in dementia. They're interested, the Centers for Epilepsy, uh, the Centers for Epilepsy uh, Excellence, uh, the Centers for Excellence in Epilepsy are funded through the VA, right? So there are, um, in the federal government, there are tens of thousands of accounts spread through various agencies. I'm trying to make sure that wherever there are resources for neuroscience, that we increase them, that we cause collaboration to be connected to the funding, that we take um, the 100,000 plus neuroscientists uh, in our country and say that we want you to know with a certainty that this is an area of great national importance, and that we're going to make sure that resources are available for merit-based scientific investigation around the 500 or so diseases and disorders of the brain and other issues related to the human brain, because it's amazing to me to think that we would be investing money and understanding what is going on in the heavens at the level that we are investing in. And I'm all for NASA and for those investments. But somehow shirk or step away or retreat or do less than our best in terms of investigating what is going on in between our own ears, right? So that I think that we should at least get some balance here in terms of uh, our, our curiosity related to science. And we should focus on trying to be, when the president says that, we want science to be an important priority of our country. I think part of getting the American public to rally around this is that they need to see science as relevant to the lives and life chances of themselves and their loved ones. And I don't think there's a family um, that is not interested in this subject when properly presented. So whether we're talking about uh, pediatric brain development or early child education or teaching and learning, or whether we're talking about mental health challenges or brain um, diseases, whether brain tumors or epilepsy, uh, that 
uh, or Alzheimer's or any of the dementias, Parkinson's and the like, that there's, there can't possibly be a family in our country that's not interested in this subject and not interested in your success. That is, in terms of learning more, understanding more, and being able to help deal with the challenges uh, related uh, to, um, to neuroscience. So that's what the Fata Neuroscience Initiative is about. Um, and you know, I've been, like I said, all over the place, and I'm going you know, here and there, but it's always good to be home. I'm happy to be here, uh, and, uh, and I'm gonna take what time we have left as I close to answer a few questions, because that's what I've been asked to do by the organizers. So I know you wanna get to the picnic, I'm gonna answer your questions and then you're gonna be able to go to the picnic, but this notion of repairing the walls, if we have a mind to work, right? I believe this, I actually believe, now maybe it's because I'm a politician and I'm not a neuroscientist, but I actually believe that we can deal with the challenges of Alzheimer's, for instance. But I, what I've learned about it is, is that it really does require us to try a set of approaches that we haven't yet tried. That is to say that Einstein was right, that you, know, you can't solve a problem uh, using the same level of thinking that has already been less than successful. You have to bring a new approach. You know? So the last time I was here at Penn, I spent a, a, a couple hours with a couple, uh, Virginia Lee and John uh, Trojanowski, which were the most, it was probably one of the most exciting times to hear, first of all, because they're just a great couple. You can tell that they love each other. But more importantly, I mean, they are just, they are so excited about the possibilities. And I was over um, next door to the campus and spent some time over Avid uh, Radio Pharmaceuticals, which was a young guy who worked up under them and learned from them as a grad student, and then went out and he set up his own company. And um, he's just got the first FDA approved. He's right here on Chestnut Street. 37th, right where Heinz Dynasty is, right there. <laughs> anyway, he's got the first FDA approved diagnostic tools for Alzheimer's, right? Um, so this is an important uh, Rubicon that's been crossed. Um, and it's just the beginning of where I think we're gonna be. And you are part and parcel of this effort and I wanna thank you for dedicating your academic pursuits in this regard. And moreover, I want to thank you for listening to me, and I'll be glad to answer your questions. <laughs> questions? One, two. Um, You're going to have to stand up, because I may not be able to identify you, but go ahead. In fact, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have you acknowledge people for questions. All right, go. Okay. So from a, both a policy perspective and from a human perspective, uh, treating neurological disease and disorder uh, on any part of the age spectrum has a lot of emotional resonance. Um, so what I'm curious about is what's the most compelling argument that you've heard to date for basic research that may not have that immediate, um, that immediate emotional resonance in any of those spectrums, just as a, as a point of curiosity for me. Well, one of the most important tools in the work of neuroscience, uh, particularly those who are dealing with on the healthcare side, treatment of, uh, of, of diseases or disorders, is the MRI, right? This is the biggest deal in a long time, right? Um, well, the MRI wasn't designed by someone who was trying to figure out how to help neuroscientists. Uh, it wasn't even developed for healthcare. The, the basic science around had nothing to do with healthcare. This was a guy who was trying to figure out what was going on in the pockets of clouds. It was about weather and, and issues, but the technology, once it was you know, uh, uh, developed, is now being used to help people be able to diagnose what's going on 
to avoid unnecessary surgeries, which is always a great thing, right? And to be able to actually pinpoint the point of difficulty so that those who are going to have to undergo some healthcare procedure, that it is, um, that it is focused uh, in the right place. So if you're cutting into the human body, it's at least focused. So then you jump ahead to the Meg machine and you go on through. But so that what we know about science is that oftentimes the most important discoveries are um, not in any way connected actually with the, the later utilization. Uh, so that's why the country can't back away or retreat from our investment in basic science. Uh, that's why the National Science Foundation is so critically important. And some of my colleagues who from time to time have difficulties with understanding why we might want to you know, do basic scientific research, um, they have to be informed about you know, some of these, the, the, the connection, the interconnection between basic scientific research and applied science um, you know, as we go forward. You're in charge. I'm a politician. I don't want to get anybody upset. You decide. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, let me make a couple of quick points on that. One is that the, the entire uh, form of government we operate on is based on one critical, irreplaceable element, which is an enlightened citizen, right? Now, which, given some of the news that people consume on some of these cable stations, <laughs> they may not be as informed as we want them to be at times. But, that's the whole basis of our form of government, is that we have informed citizens who then elect people and interact with people so that they can carry out policies that are enlightened and move the country forward. For us to be retreating, for instance, on science as a country would make no sense. I mean, the, the countries that we're competing with, and I'm all for competition. I'm not anti anybody. But if we're going to compete and, you know, we've been the global leader in the world for a while, and now we have emerging nations like China, or uh, we have uh, you know, countries with a billion plus populations, India, China, others. China says, okay, we're going to build a, a hundred science only universities. I was with Judith Roden, who's former president of, uh, of uh, University of Penn, and she's now head of the Rockefeller Foundation. She said, China decided to build 100 science only universities six years ago, and 200 in math and science universities. And five years later, they were all built. They're going to graduate 280 million undergraduates. Now, you don't have to be a math scientist. You don't have to be a neuroscientist. we got 300 million people in our country. They're going to graduate 280 million undergrads, right? They built 100 science-only universities. We, in the year 2000, we switched over for the first time in the country's history that the majority of patents given out by the U.S. Patent Office were given to non-Americans and non-American entities, right? So here's the way wealth works. So goes the patents, so goes the wealth, right? Because the patents mean new products and then people buy them, right? That's why you, when you hear these economists over at Wharton say that, you know, our economy is about 70% consumer driven, right? So, you know, when, when, when in 1981, there was this big report about the nation at risk. It was about school reform. And they said, you know, America was at risk because Japan was outproducing us in the number of engineers. And some people were saying, well, let's not worry about that. Japan's a small country. Well, now China's outproducing us in the number of engineers. So if you think about the long-term interests of the country, the only possibility for us to retain global leadership is to invest in science, develop more engineers. It's engineers, scientists, Neuroscience included about 4% of the uh, uh, working population in our country. But they generate an overwhelming 
percentage of the GDP, right? So it's very, very important that this question about our investment in science be, re be connected to, this is the answer to your actual question, connected to our national uh, positioning in the world. That we shouldn't be discussing this purely as a matter of, well, we should be interested in science as a matter of, you know, intellectual curiosity. Because that may not work to convince some of my colleagues. But it will work if you say there's no possibility for our nation to be the economic leader in this world if we retreat from investment in science. All right? There was no possibility that we're going to have the world's greatest military or that we're going to have the, you know, the best of anything if we don't make and actually increase our investment in these areas. Now, I know the time is not great for this discussion. We got sequester and we got this and we got that. This is a momentary snapshot. I think we can win this argument long term and we got to win it, un unfortunately, on the boring facts of it. That is to say, we got to make the case that if Singapore, which has got 4.8 million people, less people than in the Philadelphia region, if they can invest $7 billion in the National Science Foundation, and we're the wealthiest country in the world, and we're debating about whether we can make a $7 billion investment in our National Science Foundation, then we don't, we just are not operating with, 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 with these inhibitors and these exciters connecting up right, okay? Because we, we can obviously make the investment. It's a matter of priorities. It's a matter of, you know, you know if we're spending $2 billion a week in Afghanistan, we could probably, you know, do this if we wanted to do it, right? Next question. Hi, thank you so much for your talk and for your advocacy. Um, I guess my question is related to your idea of the enlightened citizen. And so many of us here in, in our uh, group um, are really focused on passing on our own passion. We're really excited to create the next generation of scientists that will go forward and support our work and be happy that their taxpayer money is being allocated to so it funds us and then will join us in our labs. Um, one thing that, one thing that is, is, is really exciting to us is uh, diversity of ideas. And so bringing in perspective uh, from, from people who come from many different backgrounds. And one of the things that we see is sorely lacking um, and troubling in our Philadelphia schools is the science education. And um, we, we try to bring them in here as students uh, and work with, uh, volunteer to work with these high school students to pass on our passion, um, but some of the basic concepts aren't getting there. So what I'm at, well, I guess the question I'm driving towards is how, how do we advocate to you and other congressmen, people in, in our Congress, uh, to better encourage the diversity of the pipeline through education, and I think you know your program that you've created speaks to this, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about how uh, how that affects those questions. Well, I think that the the you know we got about 50 million young people in public schools in our country. Um, we got uh, about 150 thousand young people right here in Philadelphia in, in schools, right? You know, and the way I think about it is, I said, well, there are two groups of young people in Philadelphia. We, we got 150,000 in great universities like Penn and Drexel and Temple and you know, Villanova and on and on and on, right? We got about 150 in these uh, public schools. The difference between the two groups is that the young people who are at Penn, they see their future as the whole world is, you know, this is an opportunity to do anything that they can imagine, right? And then the young people in the Philadelphia schools are not, um, their sense of their future, it may not be as we would want it to be, right? And that what we need to do is kind of, uh, we need to have this be contagious. That we, and, and the way to do that is to deal with some of the fundamental issues. One is, is that we can't have in the core subjects, like science you know, and math, um, uh, a situation where you're hard pressed to find someone who, who is teaching the subject who majored or minored in it. And so, you know, at Overbrook, which is the best high school in the world, uh, 
the, the, the front page of the Enquirer had a story maybe about four years ago. You can find the story. I'm not. This is, there's this young lady who walked out and was, was given up teaching after her first year. She had a degree in art history from University of Pennsylvania. Great school, art history. She showed up to teach art. Principal says, I do not have a algebra teacher. Don't have one? Need you to go in there and teach algebra. So after the end of that year, you had a group of kids who were, were frustrated. You had a teacher who was leaving because, you know, this wasn't what the plan was, right? And you might think this is an isolated incident, and it is not, right? That is that in the majority of the schools across our country where the diversity of what you speak exists, that is where African-American students, Latino students, or on Native American reservations, where these kids are, they are confronted with a situation where the majority of people who are teaching them the core subjects did not major or minor in these subjects. And that's not to make these teachers bad teachers. In many cases, these are people who decided to do something they're not going to be richly rewarded for. They show up in places that are, um, you know, not in our wealthy suburbs, right? Uh, and they, they, you know, Roy King wrote an affidavit in a school finance case in Alabama. He said he wanted the court to know a couple of things. One is that he loved these kids at this uh, school uh, in, uh, in, in Arkansas. There were 400 of them in the high school. He loved them. He was the entire math faculty. He taught trig, algebra, geometry. Or he wanted the court to know a couple of things. One is he hadn't taken a math course since he left high school himself. His degree was in physical ed, OK? that he had 20 textbooks for 400 kids. They did a lottery to see who could take the books home for the weekend. And he had four calculators of which three of them worked. And he wanted the court to, to have this information as they were considering it. So now, if you look at these school finance cases all around the country, you'll see in the, the, uh, the, the, the New York City case, where they said they had hundreds of schools with no library. Now, in the Philadelphia case, we had libraries and no librarians. So, you know, everything is relative. But that in the California circumstance, you have 45,000 uh, teachers who were not, um, who didn't major or minor in their subject matter. And these were teachers teaching in the core. I'm talking about science, math, and so on. So we have a system that doesn't work well. And it doesn't work well for one fundamental reason, right, which is that, um, it's based on the property tax as the principal funding block for public education in our country. That is, you, you, you tax property and you finance schools. And the state then overlays some subsidy, which helps poor school districts, right? But it doesn't overcome the, the disadvantage, right? So if you're going to teach, if you get a degree in math, and say, you know, and you're, you're a certified math teacher, you could teach in Council Rock, right outside of Philadelphia. You could teach half as many kids for twice as much money. Or you could teach in Philadelphia, twice as many kids for, for half the salary you get in Council Rock. You don't even have to be a math major to figure out where you might, where you might be drawn, right? So this is a, we have a fundamental problem in the structure of our schools, and President Nixon had a this is a guy who was around before you were born. Four, decade, four decades ago had something called the Nixon School Finance Commission. And it, this executive summary, I won't bore you with the whole detail. The executive summary says, as long as the nation has a property tax funding system, poor kids are going to get, they didn't say this, but get jerked, right? So or they said, let me, let me clean that. It said, are going to disproportionately fail. It's true today. It's just, it's just, there's no way, you could not design a system that would jerk poor kids worse than the one we have. So here you go. In Philadelphia, a third of the properties off the tax rolls. So the 525 buildings here at the University of Pennsylvania off the tax rolls. The Philip Art Museum, off the tax rolls. Every church, every nursing home, every, um, every uh, uh, a museum in the city, the sports stadium, off the tax rolls. So you get a row house in Philadelphia, you own it, you're gonna pay a higher millage than your suburban neighbors, and you're gonna put less than 
half the amount of money behind each kid's education. So you're going to pay more in property tax than if you were living in the suburbs, right? And, but it still is not going to equate to the investment you want. So I know that's much more than you ever wanted to hear about it, but we can fix it if we have a mind to work. You, gotta, you, you have to decide. Yes. So given uh, sort of the fiscal straits under which the government is operating right now, the limited amount of money that's been earmarked for the sciences, why do you think it's so important to prioritize neuroscience in particular? Um, the, let me just deal with the prefects of the question first, right? The fiscal constraints of the federal government are all a matter of political will. We are, we're the wealthiest country in the world. We actually could pay our bills. We could finance anything we want to finance. We could do almost anything we want to do. And this is evident by the trillion plus we spent in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm not beating up, I'm just saying that, you know, we actually can do, you know, I mean, if we want to spend $8 billion on a James Webb telescope, we could probably get someone operating on someone's brain to, to remove a cancerous brain tumor, the imaging tool that they need, right? It's just, it's a matter of, making the, it's, it, these are mad, I'm an appropriator. So we end up making like choices, right? So if we're gonna spend $50,000 a year to incarcerate someone for a year in the state of Pennsylvania, we might be able to spend a few more dollars on educating a kid in public school. It's just a matter of choice. Prison construction, cell construction is somewhere around a $200,000, $230,000 a cell, right? So we got homeless veterans, we could probably, rather than wait to arrest them for something that they've done because they were homeless and hungry, we could probably house them a lot cheaper than, 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 than doing it. So some of it's a matter of prioritization. And the issue on taxes is that we just have to decide whether if we want to continue to be a global leader, we can't do it on the cheap. We're going to have to spend money. And, uh, and if we're going to spend money, then that means our citizens are going to have to provide that money to the government uh, through some form or fashion, right? And uh, I think we should change our tax system, but that's the discussion for another day. But it's no question that we, can, we have the money. So then you think, your question is, well, of all the things we have to do, why prioritize neuroscience? Well, some of the decisions that are made by politicians are just arbitrary. Um, and in this instance, you know, I've decided because I'm in charge for my team, now I'm not in charge for the other team, for the Republicans, I've decided for my team, neuroscience is the most important among everything that we're doing in science. Now, you've heard me say I'm for the Webb Telescope. I'm for, I have other priorities. I'm, I've been a proponent of the commercialization of a lower uh, uh, orbit uh, space travel, right? And our investments in uh, SpaceX and uh, in some of the other companies to create a commercial uh, space exploration program mainly because I want to save money on, in terms of uh, uh, long-term uh, uh, long space exploration efforts, but, but also because of what it means for innovation. But of all of the things that I'm interested in, I've decided that neuroscience is number one, and it's because I see it connected to everything that's important. I see it connected to educational uh, uh, potential issues so that we can learn more about how the human brain works and we can, and, uh, and, and we can uh, develop better uh, teaching and learning uh, processes that that will help us uh, over the long term. I see it in terms of lowering our healthcare costs. So when I say we spent $200 billion on, the, on Alzheimer's, right, we didn't spend that, any of that on looking for a cure or effective treatment. This is all for just caring for people. Half the patients in the nation's nursing homes have Alzheimer's, half in a country in which the population is aging. So that you follow, you follow how this is gonna work, right? So it doesn't make financial sense to me to spend five billion on neuro, 5.6, it's 5,614,000,000 million on neuroscience related invest, investigations at NIH and 200 billion on nursing home care over out of Medicaid and not say that it might make sense to invest more and try to figure out how to get ahead of this challenge over the long term. So 
I think it makes sense in that of the dollar that you spend, the one thing you can't do is spend it twice. So I think that it is, that it is the, best, the best potential for a return in terms of our investment over, um, over a, a span of issues that are important uh, to our nation's future. But at the end of the day, it's a very arbitrary, almost, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a subjective thing. You get in a position and, you know, and the first thing, so, soon, so in November of 2011, I put out a tweet. I said, these are my priorities, right? I laid five of them out. This was in November. Why November? Elections. I was elected. I then knew at the time that I did this tweet that I was going to be the senior Democrat on something called commerce justice science. That meant all the commerce activities, all the Justice Department activities, and all the science activities, right? That I was going to be, I was going to be the final say-so for my whole team in the Congress on what was important. And so I put out a tweet and it said, these are my priorities. Manufacturing in the commerce space, youth mentoring in the Justice Department space, uh, and neuroscience in the science space, right? And then so I said I was going to do it. And then I laid out that we wanted to map the brain, we wanted to do all this other stuff, and then I passed that language into, what we did was, we took the language we wanted, and um, we put it in the appropriations bill. And, um, and so, and then we, you know, that, and that's how, that's how it works in our business, is that now, when I leave the Congress, someone else will show up. And they'll have my position, and they'll have their own priorities. But for every day that I'm there, and I'm gonna be there for a long time, I'll be at least another, at least, I've been there for 10 terms, and I got more votes in November of 2012 than any person who's ever gotten, who's ever run for Congress in the United, history of the United States in any district. So that should tell you something. I'm going to be there for a minute. <laughs> right? And so for the foreseeable future, at least for the next decade, Nothing is more important in terms of investment in science than neuroscience. So, first of all, thank you again for your advocacy for science, science on the Hill. Uh, you were here last April for a uh, science research symposium where you talked to faculty and students. And you said that you, know, you really wanted to encourage us to step up, like Twittering about you know, uh, uh, research projects yes. that we're making and stuff. And that's, yeah, so, it gets back to you in Congress, and your, your co colleagues are hearing about that. You know, we've, we've, since then, we've actually organized a science policy group here. I've seen it. I've seen your tweet. We went to the Hill, and we're actually going here, going down to meet, hopefully, you and other Congress members in two weeks for the ASCR. But the House has just recently pushed forward with a bill to cut the NIH by 18%. And I right. thought it's not going to get passed because you have to deal with the whole Senate. Right. Uh, 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 meeting, you know, the Senate has to obviously uh -huh. to compromise with that. So my question is, is Congress hearing from us? Are they understanding that what's, what's going on by trying to cut the NIH? You got, you got, you got exciters and you have inhibitors, right? <laughs> you got to remember this. And you got to keep things in balance, right? So it is not as complicated as the human mind where you got 100 billion, you know, neurons. In Congress, you only got 535 moving parts, right? So you got 435 in the House. You got 100 in the Senate. So it's a little simpler than the human brain. It's not... And, and the way this works is in the House, whatever the appropriation bill says in the House is not going to become the law. So you can't overreact to it. You don't want to jump off a cliff or, you know, change majors or do anything based on the House version of an appropriation bill. Because the House is controlled by a party that says they don't want, they want to spend less. So spending less means appropriation bill less than, you know, they, they, and, and so they want less. And then you have the Senate, which is in the President's party's hands, right? And their, their proposal is going to mirror more, much more closely the President's uh, priorities, right? Especially in at least the, what we would call the level of funding, right? Even though it may have some tweaks here and there, but the level of funding is going to be. And the Senate is a much wiser group, at least in theory, because they have six-year terms, they run statewide, they can't be ramrodded by, you know, some particular group of uh, uh, people on a particular issue. They, they got a much broader view of the world. And so, you know, the Senate is a place where 
almost everything important to the country, the, 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 the final solution to it comes out of the Senate. So if you think about the affordable health care debate, if you think about the, 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 the debt ceiling uh, crisis and the resolution, it usually what you can get a bipartisan vote for out of the Senate is pretty much what the final law of the land is going to look like. The House is a, a much more, um, you know, you run every two years, you're running in these districts where, like in my district, as much as people love me, in my district you have people on the other team, they have districts where people love them. And so they get elected, it reinforces their point of view. And, um, and so it's hard to see the House as the be on end all. So what you want to do, though, is you want to, um, as a citizen or a scientist uh, uh, citizen, you want to assert yourself in the process. You want your member of Congress to know that you think NIH is important, or you think the National Science Foundation is important, or you think basic uh, investments in our national laboratory system is important, or whatever it is that you think, you want to let them know. Um, but it's kind of like uh, there's a back in the poli sci, there's something, there's a whole paper on some, something called Boss Cox's Cincinnati, right? Which is about how you build a political machine. And anyway, the long and short of it, the guy comes and says, I want to be a part of this political machine. The guy says, well, how many people are going to vote your ballot? You know, at the end of the day, it's not just what you think, but it's do you represent a group of people that think like you? And that's what politicians really kind of concentrate on, right? So what I've said to the uh, scientific community in the country is that you got to be assertive all the time, not just at the point of crisis. So when we doubled the NIH budget in my early days on the Appropriations Committee, that's when you like celebrate that. And when in the stimulus debate, when Senator Specter, the late senator from Pennsylvania, said, I won't vote for it unless we get 10 billion more for NIH, and you got the 10 billion more, and you know, that's you celebrate that, right? That you can't just show up when there's a 1.8% cut and say, oh, the cut is terrible. You want to you be in the game all the time. You want to commend members. Lamar Smith did the Patent Reform Act, did a pretty good job on it. He should be applauded. Now he's got a bill that changed the merit-based uh, award system at National Science Foundation. It's, it's, not, it's terrible, right? But Lamar, when he did the patent, I said, Lamar, this is a great thing. And when he did this, I said, Lamar, that's a bad thing. You, you, you want to have a relationship. You want to have a relationship that's not one in which every time someone hears from you, you're complaining about something, right? And the other, so that the first thing is that you want to have a, a relationship that's, that's balanced. So when the Congress is moving in, so you don't like the House bill now? I guarantee you, when we finally pass a appropriations bill, it'll pass in the Senate, the President will endorse it, it eventually passed after a bunch of shenanigans in the House. <laughs> and there will be dozens, maybe 30, 40, 50 Republicans who vote for a much more moderate budget than the one they have now. And each one of them need to hear from you. And they need to be told that was a great thing that you did, that you, you know, stepped up and supported this bipartisan thing. So that when you want to talk to members, they because it's kind of like if you're in a, a relationship in which all you get is complaints. Yeah, I'm talking about a personal relationship, right? If all you get is complaints, it's very hard to kind of to, to deal with that. You know what I mean? And um, that's why they have divorce court, right? So, <laughs> so it's important to have a balance in your relationship with the Congress, right? And the other thing is that you should not assume that the Congress knows the subject matter. So here's the other thing, is that we need to be applauding scientific innovation and research every time there's a breakthrough, every time there's even the possibility of a breakthrough. We need to be celebrating it and communicating that knowledge to policymakers. Because a lot of times, members of Congress are, um, we kind of know what we knew when we got elected. So I got elected 20 years ago. right? So, because we don't have a lot of time to keep up with things. And so, you know, we're kind of burdened with what we knew. And things might have moved. So the speaker asked me to put together a group on early childhood uh, education. Some of the best people in the country on pediatric brain development, right? And so this guy from, uh, he didn't get the chance to go to Overbrook. He went to Chestnut Hill Academy. 
but he's at Vanderbilt, and he's probably the leading guy in the country on pediatric brain development, right? He shows up, and he says, look, here's the deal. The size of the human brain at birth is the most important uh, factor in terms of the, 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 the long-term ability of this brain to learn, right? In that the size of the brain is the majority of it, 59% of it is determined by the third trimester, right? So he said this, he said, look, and if, so that we need to be focused on the health of, of uh, mothers before they become pregnant. If we're interested in early childhood education, it was fascinating, right? And, but I didn't know that. And I'm one of the leading people in the Congress on education. I had no idea of this, right? So, you know, four or five years ago when we did that, I had no idea of it. And so what I'm saying is that, so we need to get, make sure that we inform members. So, you know, it's wonderful that the Journal of Neuroscience publishes a paper. It'd be much more useful, at least if the summary of whatever the discovery is, right, was also communicated to people who were deciding the appropriations for neuroscience. You see what I'm saying? Like, you have to actually connect up where the synapses here. Am I making sense? <laughs> right? All right. Are you getting to the picnic? They said one more. <laughs> uh, first, thanks again for your, all of your previous answers. It's really been exciting to sit here and listen to it. Um, so one of the things that I'm actually very curious about is a number of times you've drawn the comparison, which I think is quite apt, between um, astrophysics, you know, space research, and neuroscience research, in that they're both at their heart asking fundamental questions about what it means to be human. Uh, there you go. And so what I'm wondering is what sorts of strategies in terms of advocacy, in terms of communication, have you seen other Bless disciplines you. using that maybe we aren't or that some of us are and some of us aren't that are most effective at a policy level or at a national level at getting people's attention and getting them excited? Because that's, if you can get them excited, then that's great. Um, so. Well, I think here, here's what I would say. One is, is that what, what propels policymakers is the kind of same kinds of things that move um, citizens in general. So human stories move people, right? So, you know, when the network news last night says, you know, nine million Americans, they can't get sleep, you know, the majority of them are women who are uh, educated and white, which was, uh, and they said, and this is a big deal, right? That is something that members in a policy realm, right, think about, right? Because you got Republican parties trying to say, well, look, we want to do better among women. You know, Democrats, you know, want to keep their base among women. Educated women are a very important voting bloc. Women are the, no, white women are the number one voting group in the nation. And I'm telling you the truth, which is, you know, why people get excited when they think that a woman might run for president or something. I mean, it's an important group, a demographic, but from, a, from an advocacy standpoint, this story is important, right? This, that particular story. So when Forbes comes out today and says, at the top of their fastest growing list of companies is something called Jazz Pharmaceutical. And they're based in Philly and in Dublin. And what do they do? Well, they, they have, they've developed and have a complete monopoly on the most effective pharmaceutical product uh, to help people sleep, right? See, so now you got economic things connecting up with uh, uh, policy issues, connected up with neuroscience. I mean, it's all wired together. So the things that, that move members are stories. So, Here's a veteran. So when you say 22 veterans a day in our country, out of the millions plus, are committing suicide, 22 a day, right? 22 a day. This is connected up with the work you're doing, right? This is, this is directly related to the work that you're engaged in because the issue of mental health and depression is a, a um, some some, some, some neuroscientist from Chop and Penn who published today a little, um, not a little, a study 
showing a direct correlation between uh, depression and how neurons interact and feed on one another relative to this issue of uh, moving into uh, a, a, a depressed state, right? This is important that it's not the science of what you're doing because politicians are not scientists mainly. We're never, we're going, you have forgotten more about neuroscience than we're ever going to know. <laughs> ever. Okay? So trying to walk us through these neural networks and, you know, and, um, you know, white matter and the cortex, the visual cortex and all, this is not, going, that is not the basis under which you're going to win people over on. Okay? It's, it's this human story about this kid who fell off his bike, who's in what we would have referred to as a vegetative state, and that the question of what is the intervention, right, that can improve the life chances and circumstances of this kid, right? You know, because almost everything we thought we knew about what to do about tra traumatic brain injury 10 years ago is a little bit, you know, old, and we got some new approaches now, that those are the stories in, the, in how it connects up to these investments or the, the, the research dollars, right? So you gotta make what you're doing relevant and you have to make it human. And if that doesn't work, you gotta talk about uh, nationalistic issues like our competition, rather with larger countries like China or smaller countries like Singapore. Singapore is like eating our lunch in the life sciences, right? They are stealing more talent. They have decided that they're a small little country, less people than we got in the Philadelphia area but that they're gonna be indispensable, irreplaceable in certain focused areas, right? Agricultural science, cancer research, and so on. So, and they are, they are like, you know, whatever it takes, we're willing to do it, right? So that, so you either, so you can make the case on a human level or you can make the case on national importance, right? That's the basis under which I think we can win this debate. Um, and you gotta kinda of leave the science of it back in the lab to some degree. I mean, you could sprinkle a little just to make sure that they understand that you're not a nut and that you know what you're doing, but you, you can't harp on it because it's gonna go, you know, it's, it's gonna gloss over and they're not gonna get the real point. So um, I think you gotta talk about the, the real impact on human beings, on families, and also on the nation as a whole and that's where you can uh, win this debate. So thank you all very much. Enjoy your picking. Right. Right. Thank you.